Hi guys. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Hi Yang Yang Book Club. <laughs> it's been so yeah. long. You guys. I know. We didn't do as many live streams this month, did we? No, life is life is starting to get kind of busy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We were on a roll, but uh, life does go on. And Megan is about to start school. 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 So <laughs> Exciting. Yeah, yeah. Terrifying and all of that. I know. Yeah, because you haven't been in school for a while, huh? Five years. Yeah. 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 Let's check in with some of your friends. Hi, Shaz. Hey, Shaz. <laughs> Make sure and you say hi. Hi, Jackie. Hello, Jackie. And Daniel. And Daniel, yay. Faithful. Awesome. So if you're here, say hi in the chat. Say hi, reader friends. We want to hear from you. Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so we are... Uh, currently, unfortunately, missing our our author right now. Uh, it sounds like there's like some technical difficulties, so we're like still we're still trying to figure it out. So um, yeah, if we have to reschedule with the with the author of our our book, Eric Holtas, then we will. But uh, we're just a little unsure right now. Um, yeah. So thank you for bearing with us. Yes, <laughs> yeah, um, we might. And thankfully, him, so we really like this book and know a lot about it now. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were just spending like the whole hour <laughs> going through everything. Uh, can't say. Oh, thanks, Will. Will love seeing Will's uh, writing prompts. Yep. Every week. Every yeah. every week. You're the you're the consistent one. <laughs> so yeah, love that. Um, cool, cool. So, what was our book of the month, Megan? The Future Earth. And I'm wearing my. I'm wearing this stuff. Oh, shirt. yeah. <laughs> my planet, your planet. I love that shirt. You got it at like thrifting or something? I did get it thrifting, yeah. <laughs> yeah I always, the shirt. Pro tip for thrifting for women. Always go to the men's section because they always have <laughs> shirts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I also I have a pair of vintage Levi shorts in the men's section too. This isn't a thrifting channel, yes. but there's some pro tips. But we know that thrifting is much better for the environment. Than yes. <laughs> yes. I miss thrifting. Oh, Actually, my entire outfit is thrifted. I'm not going to show you guys. But it's thrifted. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. Yeah. Um, mine is not, but it's very old. I don't buy new clothes hardly ever. <laughs> I will buy so, new clothes, which is why I, I have like a hole in my shirt. The shirt has a the hole in it that I need to patch. <laughs> <laughs> We're just figuring stuff out as we go. <laughs> All right. Um, yes. So if cool. you guys have any. Um, favorite parts of the book, anything you thought was particularly great about the book. I know Jackie is going to have a lot to say. Um, yes. I feel like Jackie could almost lead this conversation. She's <laughs> very, very into um, and up on a lot of the current current events. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like a lot of you got the book this time. So let us know if you did and how you liked it. Um, what were some of the most interesting parts? Definitely want to hear from you. Um, and we've got a long list of stuff that like, we found very interesting that we want to get through. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we should just get in, get into it. Um, again, uh, right now it's a little unsure if Eric will actually be able to make it because it sounds like there's some technical difficulties or something. So uh, that's unfortunate, but uh, I'm sure we'll be able to reschedule if, if need be. Yes. Um, and I'm trying to <laughs> keep up communication. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I'll ask uh, uh, one of our first sort of questions for him, which I'll ask instead to the chat is, have you guys all been keeping up with all of the craziness 
that has been happening right now with um, cl some climate events. Um, has anyone been affected by it or know anyone who's been affected by any of the fires or hurricanes? I myself, I live in California. So I actually like finally went home to visit my parents over the weekend. Um, and they live up by the canyon fires that are happening kind of near the Bay Area. Um, well, they don't really live by it, but not that far either. It's maybe a couple hours away. Um, and that being said, you know, there was smoke over there, of course, but I live like five hours south and my dad's a super nerd. And so had me like look at this satellite of like how, where the fire was starting, how they had seen the, the wind pattern, pull it out to the east and then back down. So even though I'm five hours away, we were getting the, the smoke, mm -hmm. you know, the pollution from that fire here, the same fire, five hours yeah. south, like <laughs> pretty crazy. And so then my whole drive up there was like just driving through the gates of hell, I think is, is what I told you. Yeah. You were like, please be safe. I know, I was like, oh, I'm so far away from you. <laughs> what do I yeah. do? <laughs> I know, yeah, yeah. So I was not close to any fires, but it was like, it was complete, just like brown skies for miles. Yeah. So definitely crazy to be like reading this book. Well, I think I had finished the book by then, but you know, to have just recently read this book and then be experiencing that. Yeah. It's like so. the, it, you almost notice it, partly because we follow Eric on Twitter and he is always very on top of it, but it's also like, you know, it's that, that like, social theory of like if you think about an orange car then you'll so all of a sudden see a ton of orange cars it's kind of like the same thing with like climate change once you become like aware of it like you read something like this and you're like oh it's something that's on your mind i feel like you notice those issues so much more um oh yeah which you know you and i were talking about earlier today definitely comes with its own kind of anxieties in that like yeah what did i say to you i said no i I want to know this information because it's important, but knowing this information is paralyzing. <laughs> like, Yeah, exactly. It's like, I need to know this. We need to know this. We need to be aware. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess I just, I think it is important, like um, not to like put anyone on blast, but if you haven't read the book, I almost kind of wish you would let us know because it's like helpful for us as we talk about it to know if there's something we should go. Cause we always say like, if you haven't read the book, like still come to our mm -hmm. book discussions, uh, especially for, Oh, Hey, hi, mom. Mom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like tempted to say hi mom, but then people think it's my mom. <laughs> it's my mom, but it's okay. <laughs> Trick Terry to call her mom too. <laughs> um, so what was I saying? Yeah, let us know if you actually didn't read the book because um, that is actually helpful. Because um, getting to your point of like things, oh, hi, Steven. Well, fires in Santa Barbara when I lived there, including one that crossed 101 freeway into town. Yeah, I think, well, were you here when like the, we, the houses were actually lost? Because that was actually like a little while ago. I've only been here for like six years, seven years. Um, what was this? I keep forgetting what I was just saying. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, so part of like, why did we pick the book? You know, we were going to ask Eric, like, why did you write this book in the way you did? Uh, so maybe we'll ask ourselves, why did we pick this book? Um, it's like talked, like if you read the back, it says a hopeful book mm -hmm. about climate change. So I think we just felt like that's so Yang Gang because Yang is talked about as like a futurist and like the future is possible. Mm -hmm. The one where we don't die. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. And I think this is kind of a good segue into um, someone had the question, what was the most inspiring part of the book to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think everyone, let's all answer that so that we can maybe give us a, a bit of an agenda. Like I said, we have, we have plenty to talk about prepared, but, um, but we want to know like what was the most inspiring part. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Megan, do you want to go first? Yeah, so probably the most inspiring part of the book to me um, 
well, first of all, a lot of it was because I grew up in um, a religious, not household, I guess. I mean, yes, um, but in the church, we just didn't really talk about it. And I went to a private Christian school as well and in science. We didn't really talk about climate change. Um, and so I just haven't really learned that much about it. So this whole book is kind of inspiring in that now I feel like I'm informed, more informed on this topic. Like, I feel like I can have a conversation about it. I know what's going, like what's going on. Um, so that's yeah. inspiring. Uh, but also I think one of the most inspiring things is the way Eric keeps saying throughout the book, there are some things that are really bad. <laughs> there is some bad shit happening, but he also has this hope constantly throughout the book in that he really does believe that if we can just do these things and if we can just get humanity on board, like we are going to be okay and it might be a different version of okay than than we think, but we will be okay. And for me, that was helpful because reading this book, he has some very scary truths that he goes into in there and some very mm -hmm. scary things that are already happening. And so I, I appreciated and was inspired by the fact that he was cognizant to like to state that like, this is bad, but I believe in us, you know? And I, I feel like at, especially at this time, um, that's just a sentiment that we really need. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It was sort of like, I think there was a quote that was, I don't know if it was like his or someone else's, but he was like, so long as we're here, like we still have hope or we still have to act like we still have hope. Like we're still here, you know? Um, so yeah. I definitely, I definitely agree. I forgot what I was gonna say. I was gonna say something about um, something you said, but um, oh, I was curious how, and I will answer the question in a second. But I was like curious how how it was to read. So like, if you haven't read it or review, you know, like the first is kind of like still doom and gloom, but then you get to like the second part, and it's like he's writing our future as if it were history. And also the future we want where we actually achieve affecting climate change. Um, so what was that like for you to like read those parts where you're reading it and all of a sudden you're like, this hasn't happened yet. Oh, yeah. that's what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you kind of don't realize it because he does it so seamlessly. Um, he yeah. does all the headings, but you almost just don't. And he uses real history and he uses like real stuff and like quotes yeah. from people to actually talk to, but using yeah. it as if like he's in the year 2030 writing about it. Um, yeah, it was very, it was kind of trippy, <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> really cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, I think that's like one of the things where it's hopeful in and of itself. It's like meta hopeful. It's like yeah. the text itself is hopeful, but it, it's an experience. It's like experiencing hope um, as you're reading it because yeah. it's like, it's kind of just like how people say, like, you know, like just talk positive to yourself, you know, like examine your own self talk or your own thoughts mm -hmm. about yourself. Like if you just even like, even when you're like stressed and like things aren't going well, but you just like tell yourself like, it's going to be okay. You know, like, I'm going to get through this. Like you, it, it's, it doesn't really mean anything, but that yet somehow, like when we do that, it helps us get through. And like, that was, I, that was kind of like the feeling I had when I was reading those parts of the book. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um. So anyway, yeah, for me, I think one of the most inspiring things was, I mean, I can kind of relate to Daniel, I think earlier comment said I lost it you said that you like hadn't like paid you know like learned we haven't like spent a lot of time like learning about climate change and for me I'm there you go yeah uh, I've been informed on it and yeah I would consider myself that even though I'm someone who like believes in it I've always believed in it I've always you know said okay like this is not good and we need to do something about it 
Yeah. There's, you know, it's like one of those things like you don't know until you know, and like taking the time to like read a book and it's not even that long. <laughs> it's really, it's short. hard. If you're not, if you don't read the grief exercises that he has at the end, it's like less yeah. than 100 pages. I'm pretty right. sure. It's literally, wait, epilogue. So that's part of the epilogue. Like as far as the text and the actual text ends on page 200 at the end of two page mm -hmm. Anyway, so short and sweet. And um, the, yeah, it's just like you just, the, you when you take that time to like understand something <clears throat> and then the fact that he portrays it <clears throat> in such a like holistic way of like what the problem is. It's not like he goes like deep into the history or anything like that. It's just like piecing together these like concepts that we all know exist, but then putting it together in a way where it like makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, that to me, like it, it's, it's clarity. It's like, there's like this beauty to like having a clarity of mind about a subject. And not feeling like it's just this like clusterfuck of mystery and like, you know, like what even is that? I don't want to touch it, you know? Mm -hmm. Now I have like I have more clear like I don't consider myself an expert, but I have some clarity, you know, and that was the feeling for me. Yeah. So do we have any more comments? I just waxed poetic there for a while. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. yeah, his story in time with Greta was so cool. Yeah, I really oh, yeah. that part too. Um, I really was, liked that. I think that yeah. for me was the part where he, it felt so much like him. You know what I mean? Like I feel like that part to him was like excite, super exciting to write because she like gave him hope. You know, and so mm -hmm. I. Felt while he was writing that he was kind of reliving it and being like this is what we need you know the youth are like mm -hmm. the youth is are how we how we are going to get ourselves out of this um and that was really inspiring for sure mm -hmm. um yeah yeah did anyone notice <laughs> <laughs> that's a <Tinder>? <laughs> YG book club making making love connections. <laughs> I love it. That That's is great. Amazing. That I I'm not. Let us know how that goes. I was having a hard day. That just made my day. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and so you know great. Why? Thank you for sharing, Daniel. I, true story. Here's a little input into my life. True story. When I met my husband, um, <laughs> I actually learned, like, memorized the stats for the Ravens and, like, downloaded oh, yeah, the an app and everything so that I could talk to him about it. And so that just yeah. made me so happy that you read this book and you were like, I can have this conversation now and I can, like, I just love that. Oh, my cheeks we are to, like, we're not even like 30 minutes in and my cheeks are already hurt. Yeah, like, <laughs> oh. yeah, let us know how that one goes, Daniel. And uh, if you end up reading more books on climate change to, <laughs> to, to help you out. Um, oh, I was saying, um, did anyone notice a reference to freaking last month's book? Right. August, July. Yeah. Megan. You know from to this from this is an uprising? Oh yeah, he did. The yeah. Three the three point five percent. Yeah. Goal. I yes. I, did, I read that and I was like, it's so interesting how all of the books we're reading connect. And like we did not do that on purpose. <laughs> yeah. We did not yeah. do that on purpose. Yeah. So yeah. how cool was that? Yeah. So if you read last month's book and this month's book. There was um, this really important statistic study that was done where like um, someone looked at the data on all of these kind of movements that had happened within the last like century or so. And like the ones that had ach actually like, achieved their goals essentially, like how much of the actual population of their country or whatever 
um, had participated to be able to make the change happen. And it was 3.5% of the population. Mm -hmm. It was not very much. And it's in some cases it was less. So, um, so that was brought up obviously in the book that we read last month, which was mm -hmm. on movements and social movements and stuff. But then he brings it up in this book um, just to, as a thing of the thing, like, Hey, if we want to get some legislation passed, like a green new deal or whatever, like mm -hmm. we don't actually need like 50% or, or, or yeah. a majority, you know, like we think of turn in terms of majority, but it's like, well, no, it's like the data shows yang gang that it does not take that much really. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I know I, it's not as simple as that, but yeah. It's still helpful. Um, so I wanted to get this comment from Steven. The book was hopeful and informative, but I was disappointed in his theory of change on page 194. That's much too vague. People don't simply show up. He skips several key strategic steps. So, yeah, he doesn't necessarily lay out what he thinks, like A, B, C, here's what we do. Um, so I'm just going to read it real quick. But he says, my theory of change is simple. Billions of people just showing up in their own lives, energetic and ready to struggle together. Too often we hear that in a representative democracy, the most important thing you can do is vote. But what about the other days of the year? This is a crisis. We don't have time to just wait until the next election. Um, and so he kind of goes into it more, just talking about how like, you know, to have radical societal change, we have to start changing our own behavior and then kind of go out from there. Um, and then he does say something that I think is one of the most important things that we can do in our lives. And he said, that's why I think the single most important thing each of us can do about climate change is talk about it with anyone who will listen. We exist in a crisis and during a crisis, there are voices that often get drowned out. When someone talks with you about the climate emergency and how it's affecting them in their life, listen. And I actually, I have this like, highlighted and everything because I think that is so important. And I was actually, I talked to my mom about this today. Do you have it too? I, I did talk about it and then listen. Yes. yes. Because I think, I think that is one of the most, I'm, I'm not going to say like radical, but like, I, I think that is the, one of the best things that you can do when trying mm -hmm. to create change is talk about it. You have to talk to people. You can't just scream into the void on Twitter. We can't even, you know, it, the conversations that Kateri and I have with you guys even here helps, but also just the people in our lives. Talk to them. Talk to people. This is what I say about UBI as well. You can't expect people to just know what it is or how it works or how, how it could affect them. It's also, yeah. you, you have to talk to people about it. Um, and so I think, I think for him in this short book, he's just trying to get out what he thinks is the most important thing. Um, and that's mm -hmm. starting with yourself and then mm -hmm. the people around you. Cause mm -hmm. really most of us, most of us don't become big politicians or movie stars or big sports players, you know, like most of us are just normal people living normal lives. <laughs> and really what we can change is around us, you know, mm -hmm. and the only yeah. way that starts is by talking to each other. And so to yeah. me, like I understand Stephen where you're coming from. I really do because I think so many of us just want, what do we do? How do we change this? Give, give me the steps and I'll do yeah. it. Um, but yeah. that's not, I, that's not super what his book is for. Um, I think his book was just this urgent plea, you know, this urgent, let's do something yeah. because if we don't, this is what's going to happen. And if we do, yeah. this is what's going to happen. Um, but he talks about it in here. Uh, Kateri brought this up when we were talking before we got on about, um, we don't know what we don't know, <laughs> you know? So like, yeah. you know, so I think, I think that, yeah, that transitions well, like your whole, what you're basically point you're making transitions well into that, that I wanted to bring up and also just, you know, kind of my response to that of, of like what the book is, you know, like there's plenty of books on climate change and they're all different, you know, like they're not all the same book. Um, and like what you were saying, like to me, like what the book is, is like, it's ideas. It's like trying to like, it's literally like trying to like open your mind to like having a, a more radical 
by, as in like grabbing it at the roots, understanding of climate change. It's not scientific. It's not like even necessarily political or like if you said like a, like a step-by-step guide. Whereas like the last book we read, like that was much more like mm-hmm. practically a step or like a manual of sorts. Whereas this one is more just like, it's getting at the spirit of things. Um, and, and just opening you up to different ideas and ways of thinking. So on that note, um, let me have, I have it up here. Uh, early in the book on page 61. Oh my gosh. Um, no, that's not it. Here we go. Sorry. On page 33. There's a, this is like one of the initial uh, things that really like struck me. Um, so this is said by, oh yeah, someone by the last name of Earl. I don't know his first name. Anyway, oh, Samantha Earl, a woman, a philosopher. Um, the major problem with society is that we don't even recognize that we have a particular imaginary, that this is not how things have to be. Earl told me. During normal times, we lack critical awareness and we lack the capacity to radically imagine. Um, And then like as a follow-up quote on page 34, um, this is said by another philosopher by the name of Alex Steffen. Um, Climate change is first and foremost a problem of our relationship with the future. Um, So I think like that kind of gets at like what the book is like because he puts it in the beginning you know like he's really trying to help us realize that like the paradigm that we operate on is like it's not going to be enough to help us solve climate change like we haven't we have to have a new imaginary and then i think you kind of said this that i had said this which was like we don't know what we don't know Um, so he really gets into like the importance of imagination and creativity and ingenuity, um, and having an open mind. And I, and Jackie brought this up and this was a point that I wanted to get into. We can maybe do that next is like the importance of, um, indigenous populations Mm -hmm. and the way that they, like, I feel like that's talk that we hear all the time. Like, oh, you know, like native people, like they're so in tune with the, with nature and stuff like that. And we kind of like romanticize it. Whereas it's like, it's practical. It's like, you know, it's like something that we've just gotten away from as a society. And it's not even like our fault entirely, like, which is another thing that he talks about, which is like, it's more like corporations and stuff like yeah, that. Let me, let me tell that. Cause, oh my gosh, since we're here, I will just talk about like, give that, stat real quick because i think about this every single day since i read it um Mm -hmm. on page 122 at the top of the page in a world where the richest 85 people 85 people in the world own as much wealth as the bottom three and a half billion billion And the wealthiest 10% produce 49% of all emissions, if not individual choices that are driving climate change. When we realize that rich people have stolen our planet's habitability for themselves, we will demand revolutionary change. (laughs) I think about that every day, you guys. (laughs) It haunts you. What the heck? What the heck? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, so yeah, so like so much of the book is just about like the radical things about our, um, our society and the way it's made up. Um, so then I think that's, it's great to contrast that with the passage that I was, that was mm-hmm. so striking to me. And then, and Jackie, if you like have a quote from this part, you, you mentioned the, um, the Marshallese. So um, this is on page 81. And um, as far as I remember, this whole section is um, him talking to um, a woman named Selena Lee Leem. 
who is from the, uh, she's a Marshallese, so she's from the Marshall Islands, which I don't even know much about the Marshall Islands, you know, <laughs> yeah, I had to like look it up. Um, and uh, so this is at the point, at the time she's 18 years old to the 2015 Paris Climate Summit. <clears throat> and so she's kind of like describing like being a representative from a, a small island nation um, and what that was like uh, for her seeing how all of these representatives from these world powers essentially like treating her, her people. Um, so I'm just gonna read this passage uh, on page 81. <clears throat> Selena was shocked. It just hit me. I was like, wow, the rest of the world is already saying goodbye. I just sat back and thought, what is all this advocating for? What is the role of us Marshallese and us Islanders going around and telling the world that we still want our islands to be there? Yet it's already very obvious from the woman's response and from the crowd, the way they all accepted it very solemnly, that it's already going to happen. No matter what we do, it's still going to disappear. There are moments like this where I really just want to start yelling and pointing fingers. How many people have already stood on this stage where I am standing? How many more people are going to be crying here and their pleas gone to ears where no one listens? We are not ready to say goodbye. It's like, ugh, so sad. Like, um, so yeah, uh, I think, um, I mean, that one gets at like the emotion of it, but you know, so much of what this future earth that, you know, we're talking about, you know, if you wanted to get into specifics, he does talk about how like, you know, like for instance, Puerto Rico should be a state and like, we need to, um, we need to allow native people to actually have sovereignty over their lands again and like say goodbye to some of that tourism stuff that, you know, some of us like, I mean, I don't, I've never been, <laughs> been to Hawaii like once. Um, and, and also like, listen to them. Like, you know, we regulate how native people have been, you know, nurturing and running the land for centuries like millennia like you know like for very very long amounts of time and they have the answers like they know um and, and the knowledge that they do still have like they know what we can actually do to work and coexist in tandem with with the planet and mm -hmm. so like he would uh, I, I just thought it was so interesting. It's not something you ever hear talked about. Like you hear, you know, reduce your carbon footprint and, you know, waste less. And like, those things are obviously important, but you never hear like, we need to, oh yeah, word of, use the word consent, you know? Um, that's a really good point. You know, like uh, if, if we had a democracy where that was actually possible for everybody, we probably wouldn't be here because you know, these, these other ways of living would actually still be, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, um, as like a native person, I'm part native. So, you know, that like really hit home for me. Um, you know, part of my like recent history is like being pushed out of definitely have, have a history of being pushed out of tribal lands and, and not being able to return and stuff like that, you know? That's not what we want to do. We want to do the opposite of that. Like, let us, you know, yeah. let us have the land. Let let indigenous people have the land and, and let, like, listen to them and learn from them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Living with. I it up and then accidentally pressed it too fast. <laughs> I'm not giving any of you time to read any of these comments. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I can tell Jackie really likes a lot of this. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's like, thanks for the really, input, Jackie. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I think that's kind of a good segue into one of the other things we want to talk about is kind of this restructure um, of society. Um, you know, and he, he does get into like the infrastructure. Uh, one of my favorite parts was saying how we should have more trains and like stuff like that. Yeah. And then use yeah. cars and bikes for what he called like last mile transportation. So, you know, you could take a train, but it only stops like a mile from where you work. And so they'll have like electric cars and like bikes and stuff. 
um, which I really like mm-hmm. that. He does get into some of the infrastructure, but a lot of what he talks about, about reworking and restructuring society is more so like the human side, how we treat each other, um, you know, just like how, how we are humans, I guess, you know, how, yeah. I guess it's like a restructuring of our humanity. Um, you know, and we, we had that one question for our Think Harder Thursdays. We'll shout out there. Um, you know, what would the world be like if we intrinsically trusted one another? And one of the reasons, reasons we chose that was because of this book. You know, he, mm-hmm. he does talk about like, we don't trust each other. And that's one of the reasons we can't work together to create solutions because we don't trust that your solution is going to actually help me. I don't trust you mm-hmm. to do this for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so he, he so kind of like tribalism. Mm-hmm. He you know, talks about, like, you know, a lot about just reworking society and, you know, just being human again, you know, and that's definitely very Yang gang. Um, you know, we're all interested in humanity first and all of that. And he, he just really does um, get into that a lot about um, just the way we treat each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it was definitely like nice to think of climate change in terms of that, in terms of, you know, coexisting and and getting along and like all of these things like also matter to how we affect our environment. And I think, you know, that's the idea, like that's the definition of um, an ecosystem. That's the word, right? <laughs> uh, you know, the idea of like an ecosystem is like everything matters, right? Like everything affects everything else. And so mm-hmm. if you take it to that degree, like of course the way we treat each other matters, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, and of course that applies to our politicians. Yes. Corporations, <laughs> just as well as it does to like neighbor to neighbor. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, so that that was like and then I think that kind of gets into like the idea of democracy. This was one of the quotes that we also shared that I thought I really liked. Um, so on page 103, for those of you who have the book. Um, I'll just read it here. Uh, Success on climate change where it can exist will look like democracy. To build a sustainable, just world for the next century, everyone will have to participate, especially those who have been excluded from the political process for far too long. Inclusive society is a just society in which we all listen to one another with genuine care. Um... So yeah, I think that kind of sum all those thoughts up, up together. And so it's like, it's so interesting to think that like, this is another like kind of big picture thought that I had. Like, we think of all of these like issues, political, social justice issues as like kind of being separate from one another, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think especially like for Yang Gang, like UBI, I don't know if we got into it as deeply as we could have. Um, but I think now that we have more time to think about it, um, UBI, oh, hello, let's see. Well, it worked. Hello, Eric. Hi. Hi. Sorry, Hi. I'm, sorry I'm 39 minutes late. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. Yeah, uh, there was, yeah, we had some, some issues, but that's okay. Um, we're so glad that you still showed up. We've been having yeah, I'm sorry. a blast more- talking away. <laughs> I was mowing my yard the entire time and I was totally oblivious and I didn't realize what time it was. I'm sorry. Oh, that's so funny. Okay, okay, okay. That is well, so you know, I know how I know how the, the housework can like <laughs> yeah. get you into another <laughs> dimension. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, we've been waxing poetic about all the beautiful things in your book so far, but oh. we love to hear like from you. Um, so we have, I don't know if you can see the chat. We have people in the chat. I cannot um, see that right now, but that's okay. It's okay. Yeah. There, I I think there is like a private chat and a public chat. Okay. Sure. I can see the, the uh, messages coming up on the screen. 
the YouTube yeah. version of this. Yes. Yes. Cool. 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 Yeah, because we're just on YouTube right now. All right, great. Cool. So I'm Terry. And Hi. I'm Megan. And then Megan is over here. I haven't formally met face to face. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um what so like one of the questions we like had for you was like, the original idea. It was just like, can you tell us like how the book came together? Um, but also specifically, like what was your idea for like how you wrote our future as if it were like history? Because that was like one of the most striking things for all of us. Sure. Yeah. Um, first of all, the so the book started as a choose your own adventure book. I don't know if you guys remember those books from the eighties. Um, they, are, them. yeah, they, they're. It's just sort of like you are playing. It's like a. It's like a. I mean, the the general name for it is a game book, where mm -hmm. you are playing the game as you're reading, and you can make choices and interact with the book. Um, so you flip to a certain num. You flip to a certain page number corresponding to whatever choice you make at the end of the chapter. And so that was what I was going to do for this book. Um, I had a draft written um, of that book and it turned out um, after talking with my editor and thinking about it for a while, it was that um, the original book had 15 different endings and you know a lot of them were apocalyptic and just like any other climate book where where you're saying like, you know, the odds are stacked against you and no matter how hard you try, it's not gonna end up in your favor because that's just how life goes sometimes. And that's like, that's not really satisfying. You know, like people already know that. So yeah. it's not mm -hmm. new information. Um, so I thought that the new information would be, there are still choices that we can make that will steer us towards a better world. I think that's the message that uh, if you read, um, if you read uh, climate, the climate science studies and assessment reports going back decades, that's been the consistent message from scientists is that by making certain choices, we are putting ourselves on a certain path and those choices can always be different. Um, and so we decided to write a book that was corresponding to what, what would it look and feel like if we uh, make the choices that we need to make um uh, mm -hmm. in order to create ra the radical change that is possible it's still possible um and showing just you know a vision of that future where um where we do um we, we do what we need to do and um and so you know my editor and i agreed that that um that is the climate book that no one had written uh yet and that is the kind of book that the world needed uh right now so um yeah. so that's what we did and um i've been just so thrilled at everyone um in this group uh their enthusiasm at you you guys enthusiasm and um and all of the you know there's at least 20 universities now that are using this book for for courses this fall um it has been really exciting to see the uptake of people um, who are, um, you know, I don't know. I, I think, I think that um, you know, when I had the what, the audience I had in mind when I was writing was you know, fifteen to thirty year olds, um, you know, people who grew up with the climate crisis, who knew, you know, like some of the first some of the first uh, memories of um, the climate emergency for Gen Z folks is probably, you know, like being told that it's already too late. And mm -hmm. I, I don't really know that that's accurate. I don't think that's true. So um, it, I just can't imagine, um, you know, for my kids, at least, my kids are uh, four and six years old. And, uh, you know, they're gonna, the story that they're gonna learn is the story of what happened, you know, like by the time they're in high school, we'll, we will have either, you know, steered all of society on a different path or we haven't. So they've sort of like, it's only really Gen Z that has the agency, Gen Z and millennials that have the agency to be young enough and enthusiastic enough to go out and say, my re the rest of my life is ahead of me 
eight, you know, 80% of my life, I'm going to be living with the consequences of the decisions that we're making right now. And mm -hmm. I feel like those of us that are really enthusiastic about doing this work that this book is written for, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing we, we talked about this earlier, but I think it'd be fun to point out to you. Um, so we read one book a month mm -hmm. and our previous book, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called This is an Uprising mm -hmm. by Mark en Engler and Paul Engler. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of to your point, talking about like the importance of youth in the movement, um, you mentioned the the 3.5% rule of like, mm -hmm. you know, social movements being consistently successful if they mm -hmm. had that amount of support. Um, and so that statistic was mentioned, of course, in the last month's book. So mm -hmm. it, it was just so like funny to just like, and like striking to like see it pop up in your book as well. It like just like mm -hmm. felt very fortifying. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And what I was going to say too is like definitely that, that hope that you were talking about, that you were hoping to mm -hmm. convey is definitely coming through, Great. you know. I, I really enjoyed personally that you stated the facts, you didn't sugarcoat it. Mm. But you were also like, but you said it's not too late. We can still do something. And for me, I really appreciate that because I've grown up hearing it's too late. There's nothing we can do. It's, you know, and I'm, I'm a millennial, but like, you know, you bring up the point of Gen Zers and that's literally all they've heard <laughs> is that it's too late. And, you know, um, I feel like that hope, it definitely comes through. And for me, that's what made, you know, reading the book enjoyable because sometimes having all of the information is like paralyzing because yeah. you don't know what to do with the information. You don't know how to process it. And a lot of what you go through in the book um, and what I wanted to ask you about is the anxiety surrounding it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, why for you, I guess what I wanted to ask is, why did you think it was so important to address the anxiety and the mental health concerns that go along with climate change? I think that, um, again, that's that's one of the main ways this emergency is manifesting in people, I think. I mean, th these are the conversations that I have, you know, like off the record with friends and with family. Um, it always comes up in almost every conversation. and. And it's not something you hear covered in the news or you hear in, you know, like, I don't know that Al Gore, or in, when he gives the speech, has, talk, has much, you know, talk about like that, like the main standard bearers of the climate movement don't really engage at the at a deep emotional level, I think, uh, in sort of saying this, this work is hard, it's scary, and um, you are going to want to give up pretty much all the time, but um, but um, I don't know. It it just feels like, um, at least for me, also I have experienced it myself to the point where um, when I'm writing a story about wildfire or hurricane or something, like I feel that paralyzing anxiety as I'm writing, as I'm as I'm trying to convey that information and say like. Man, it's happening again. Like, when is this ever going to stop? Like, it's like a, a combination of anger and frustration, and yes. um, and like my future is being stolen away, and um, and I think I just, I just yeah. really wanted I really wanted to engage with experts who knew, um, who knew um what to do with those feelings and like like for myself and as like a, you know, public service to say like, there are like, you don't have to um, turn away from that. It's not a negative emotion. It may feel uncomfortable, but we have to be uncomfortable in this because because changing the world is uncomfortable. You know, it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna feel easy when you're doing it. None of this work is easy. It's not fun to work on climate change, really. It, you're engaging with trauma every day, all day. And that's not really mm -hmm. something that people, I think, cho would choose to do if they had a choice, but we do it because it's necessary. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think, um, I don't know. And that's why I wanted to invite um, people uh, 
to uh, small group discussions. I mean, like this discussions like this one, where that is kind of out in the open and and um, uh, not a taboo topic when you're talking about um, climate work because it um, it really is. I mean, the work that we're doing is really trying to learn how to treat each other better and to treat the earth better, and that you know, you have to sort of lead by example and show what those interactions look like in order to build that world. So it starts with your organizing groups. It starts with book clubs. It's, I mean, like it starts with having conversations with your friends and family about, um, about climate, you know, like chances are, if you're on this call right now, you're probably more, um, engaged on climate than 99% of your friends. So um, you are you you are that climate person for your friend group. And it's okay to like, it's okay to, to bring it up and say like, you know, I just saw like the wildfires again, like I'm just, it's scary to see and I don't really know what we're gonna do. Like what, what do you, what do you think? Like, how, like I don't know, like it, um, I don't know. I, I think I think that the more that we can show an example in our circles that there is hope, that there are things that we can do, um, that's going to be how those messages spread. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. That's so. Yeah, we were we were talking about that. You know, like how it's empowering just to have just to create these spaces and learn about things and hear each other like talk about the things that like are terrifying to us and it doesn't necessarily feel like you're doing anything but just having felt that emotion and that like mm -hmm. connectedness with other people of like oh you're scared too and like i'm not alone and i'm not crazy and mm -hmm. and you know it's like i think that's that's what like gets things going to then say okay well maybe you know there is something we can do about it mm -hmm. um so yeah, yeah, that was definitely our goal with with picking the book. So Great. thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, and thanks for writing it. Um, yeah, um, I also wanted to talk about how um, we, we were talking about like how you talk about the importance of like indigenous peoples, and um, I've been following some of like your your kind of not town halls, what do you call it? Like calls you've been doing with different activists like mm -hmm. all over the world. Yep. And as something I am part native and it's just like, it's very, it's eye opening for me. And um, it, 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 I've been, I feel like a sense of clarity knowing that these things are so like intertwined and you talk about the importance of decolonization and also democracy and consent and just all these really, really like big things. And it's just a conversation that I feel I haven't seen happen in the climate change space. And so I'm just curious, like for you, like what, what, um, when did you first start to think along these terms? You know, are, are there people that guided you here and, and, and what does it all just really mean to you? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that it was honestly doing interviews for the book. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to sort of be led in the direction. Um, when I was when I was doing those sort of 15 different um, uh, paths that we could that we could take uh, to try to solve the climate crisis, um, I wanted to um, be open to um, paths that were not considered. Um, you know, by the mainstream climate discourse of just trying to understand what are, you know, asking questions about what, um, what it would, what it will actually look like to engage on the scale of the problem and mm -hmm. actually asking what the problem is in the first place. And so, um, through through all of those interviews that I used to create the book, um, there was this thread that came out that ended up being the focal point of that the introduction section, where it was um, saying like the, the 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 problem itself is not just 
the climate emergency. The climate emergency is a symptom of a larger problem, which is injustice and racism and colonialism and extractive capitalism and everything that has been happening over the last 500 years to deviate away from um, sort of what, um, I don't know. I feel like there's a struggle, there's a struggle against romanticizing um, pre-industrial era <laughs> because it was mm -hmm. a brutal place and people died at age 35 and like all the time. And right. I, think, yeah. I think it it was not something clearly that we're trying to return back to. And I think that is right. sort of the core of the criticism of the Green New Deal is like, we want us to all live in caves and eat, you know, like bugs. And it's like, that's not, I don't, think anyone, yeah. I don't think anyone wants that. You know, like uh, what yeah. we're asking to do, what we're asking for is, is everyone having their basic needs met, right? Like that's not asking too much. All right. Yeah. We, we want to have a society that works for everyone. That's not just, you don't you, like, you shouldn't have to work to, um, you shouldn't have to work to, uh, gain the basics uh, for staying alive, like housing, food and water and healthcare, you know, safety, personal safety. These are all non-negotiable items that everyone should have access to. So, right. um, so I think that if you use that as a starting point and understanding um, what are some of the most, you know, because industrialized Western human civilization is only, you know, 150 years old, if that, and, you know, like, if we learn from other ways of having human society, um, I think that, you know, taking a more ecological approach, um, and this was my conversations with Kyle White at the beginning of the, um, of the, uh, the book, um, that really helped formulate, um, you know, what I'm, what I'm, what I was imagining to be sort of the basis of this next um, decade was sort of returning to that um, idea of reciprocity and consent and living living together in an ecosystem, which is the most fundamental truth that we have is that we are animals that live on a planet with other animals and other plants. And like, right. that is the non-negotiable thing that we were born into when we, when we became alive. So uh, I think that if we use that as the found, fun, fundamental basis of, of the recovery from this, you know, 500 year history of deviating from that, I think that, is really we're really returning to what it means to be human rather than um rather than doing this ridiculously untested crazy living in caves thing that it's often like talked about being so yeah. i don't know I, it just ended up you know and, and i ended up being able to pull out threads from you know urban planning and from um from advocates for democracy and um, and um, folks that are activists or like um, organizers, and all of it to me was was trending towards the same answer of we just need to learn how to live in relationship with each other again. Like we know how to do this; we've done it before for thousands of years, yeah. and. Um, and um you know it's gonna take a long time to relearn that but it, it doesn't mean that it's not possible yeah right. um, i think that was one of my favorite parts of the book actually was how you did go into some of the infrastructure of like how to restructure society but i also love that you talked so much about the human aspect of that of just that base basic rest i can't say the word <laughs> that basic reciprocity is that how you say it you know <laughs> this basic humanity you know, yes. human loving other humans yeah. um you know i i love it so much of it was just 
you talking about, yeah, sure, everyone talks about restructuring society as, as in how we restructure transportation and all of that. Yes. I feel like everybody talks about that, mm -hmm. um, especially when we're talking about climate change, but I feel like nobody ever <laughs> goes over the human aspect of mm -hmm. it, you know, and I, I really appreciated that. Yeah, and I, I mean, that was an explicit intention of mine in the book is to not talk about solar panels or like green roofs or anything like that, because that has been talked about way too much. It's like, what, what would be the motivating factors to make those kinds of policy decisions inevitable? I think that, um, you know, and honestly, that idea of reciprocity is core to almost every world religion, too. It's, it's something mm -hmm. that we know that that is the basis of humanity is living together in community with your neighbors and um, trusting each other and building that trust takes time. And right now we don't have it. We don't have that trust. So, you know, like it's very, very, very clear, even in the last five to 10 years that has really um, gone downhill a lot, at least especially in the United States. And, um, and you know, you like, it's encouraging, it's, it's it's super traumatic, but it's very encouraging to see that starting to come back up as a fundamental part of political discourse now um, in the last um, few months, you know, especially since the killing of George Floyd, that we realized that we have crossed the line as a society and we can't normalize this anymore. So uh, it's su it's super refreshing to see people you know, out there willing to put um, put everything that they have on the line to say, I'm not going to participate in the system anymore until we change it. Yeah. Um, so it's happening, you know, the uprising is happening and that's what it's going to look and feel like, um, you know, magnified tenfold to see um, the Green New Deal become law, really. I mean, that's what it's going to take at this point, I think. Um, so... Right. No, that's what I wrote in in that section of the book. Is that it's gonna it's gonna feel like chaos as it's happening, probably. But that's just because we don't know what's next. You know, like we don't know right. when it's gonna stop. Yeah, so. I think um, this is also an earlier quote from our friend Daniel. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about like liminality and like how yep. we're in a liminal space, and I also uh, quoted about how early early on in the book you mentioned that um or someone else you quote someone else who says our biggest difficulty with climate change is our relationship with the future yeah um and how we don't know what's really possible we don't really know what's coming next we don't mm -hmm. entirely know how to get there we have like a good idea but you know it's like a lot of what ifs and like we think and but let's do it anyway because mm -hmm. you can't do nothing right yeah yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, you kind of got at this a little bit earlier, talking about basic needs. Um, as the Yang Gang Book Club, we would be remiss <laughs> if we didn't mention <laughs> the fact that you do actually mention uh, UBI. And then also mm. a little more recently, um, Andrew Yang was talking about like the, the importance of a four day work week. Yeah. And, and that was a part of a list uh, of other things that you said yep. will be yep. uh, necessary, like no more billionaires and like stuff like this that yep. were just like, it's not working, guys. <laughs> this is mm -hmm. a, uh, what we need. So I was just curious uh, if you could just to speak to that a little bit of some of the sure. things that you see our future world uh, mm -hmm. having. Yeah, and I think that's part of it. It's just like figuring out a way to make sure that everyone's basic needs are met, where the point of being alive is to create value for um, for society, you know, to, to make, um, to make, um, life richer and life worth living. And, you know, like people go to work so that they can um, have time to like play in the park with their kids. They don't go to work so that they can like, you know, pay rent and pay the mortgage and pay for healthcare. Like those are things that it's not exciting to save up for those, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, I don't know. I, th I feel like, I feel like in in order to do the world changing work uh, on on climate, um, we need more time. We need more free time, you know, free time during the week to do that work. 
um, we need to have room for art and creativity and book clubs and you know like all of the all of that um, organizing work needs to ha happen at some point during the day, you know. Um, so um, so I think that freeing up more time for people to do that work is absolutely necessary. And, you know, like and taking away part of the anxiety of always living paycheck to paycheck is part of that, you know, like uh, for a lot of folks who don't have the luxury of, um, of having extra money every month, you know, it's just a constant struggle there and you're and there's just no like your your brain chemically changes to where you are always living um in emergency mode mm -hmm. and there's no space for your brain to imagine the future um when when you are focused on fight or flight and mm -hmm. i think that you know that's that to me is the main benefit of ubi or of a four-day work week or of um universal um health care or you know like housing uh housing guarantees or um any of those green new deal um policies are designed to give us more time and more brain space to yes exactly need the boot off our necks so we can look up and be aware and do something exactly that's right yeah and i feel like there's a lot of you know unfortunately like blame that get, gets put on people who don't have the bandwidth you know people yeah. working people like a lot of blame gets put there that um you know you need to like care about this thing and i think that was one of the things about uh, kind of following andrew Ying on the trail that stuck with me about thinking about even some of like some of my family members who are i know are not really thinking about climate change in a serious way um or even to a certain extent denying it um but they're also like they're struggling like you know so it's like it's it's hard it's not comfortable to like think about but i think that when you put it in those terms it, it provides a lot of clarity and yeah you know makes me want to fight for ubi a lot more <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah uh so that's great um yeah thank you for like speaking to that um, I think I only have one more question. Megan, did you have another question? Or do you have another um, thing that we want to just discuss? Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to bring up um, one of the biggest statistics that has just been like sticking out in my mind. <laughs> and I was talking about this <laughs> earlier was on page 122 of the book where you say the richest 85 people own as much as the bottom three and a half billion. Mm -hmm. And yeah is 10% produce almost 50% of all emissions. I think mm. about that every day. And like, it's mm. just like yeah. really stuck in my mind. And that's kind of, you know, what Kateri was talking about earlier is, uh, you know, some of the blame gets put on individuals. Like you're eating meat, you don't ride your bike, you're doing all this stuff. And it's yeah. like, it's all I can afford to do. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't know, you know, and it's in reality is that you even say like individual choices aren't what's creating this problem. You mm. know, I, that statistic, I don't know. I just, I, I it's really stuck with me um, mm. after reading it, you know, um, cause I feel like sometimes there is some guilt that's kind of put onto people and it's mm. like misplaced, but you don't know that it's misplaced because you don't know that statistic. Yeah. To me, the main, the main goal of reducing your carbon footprint is to live more in like in right relationship with yourself so that you can feel like you are doing your best in your own life within reason to, um, you know, live an ethical life and to be not be a part of the problem. So mm -hmm. but that extends to your relationships, to how you treat your friends, you know, to like, um, to you know if you are actively anti-racist you know like all of those are individual actions that will help solve the climate crisis it's not just recycling how much how much you can put in what then most efficiently like that's 
you know, if you are spending more hours of your day doing that kind of work than political organizing, like, you know, and I know like political organizing doesn't work for everyone. Like I'm not, I don't feel like I'm a political organizer, like, but writing or being creative or, or, you know, going on a bike ride or um, being in nature or um, any of those things I would say are arguably more effective at solving the climate emergency than recycling at this point. Because mm -hmm. I mean, really, yeah. because because also um, the economics of recycling have changed so much where a lot of the stuff that is, is um, collected by recycling trucks is just thrown back into the waste stream anyway, because there's no, there's no like cash market for it. Mm -hmm. Like they're, it's a break even on cardboard right now. Um, so like half the time they just throw it back in the landfill anyway. So I don't know. It's just like, and that to me is the most depressing thing is like I'd spend, spend time, uh, you know, trying to think like I'm doing my part and then it just doesn't matter. You know, like I feel, I feel way more excited when I, publish an article or when I like have a good conversation with someone where I feel like I'm connecting with them or, you know, like if I know that that someone else is trying to work with me on building a better world and making large scale change, I feel like that those actions will add up to create a critical mass more like there's a greater certainty that that will work than any level of incremental change, I think of individual action yeah and yeah. yes you, and yes, like you, good yeah yes you should definitely try to you know the number one um the number one footprint carbon footprint item for most people is your daily commute to and from work and now you know with the pandemic like people are working from home so that has made a huge impact on lifestyle changes so spending this time during the pandemic to sort of figure out um what is going to happen when i have to go back to work or like what is going to be my strategy for getting to and from work like if you can focus on radically changing one part of your life every year or every five years or every 10 years or you know like whatever feels um good to you or like cutting out um animal products from your diet you know like those are things that you can do um, uh, you know, while you're doing these other, uh, parts of, of your life while you're changing these other parts of your life. But, but I think that putting it on yourself to change the world entirely on your own is not going to happen. I mean, like, that's why, um, you know, I, I just think the, the fundamental, um, calculus is that, we will we will not be able to change the world if it's just a bunch of individuals doing our best. We will have to join together at some point because our work, when we work together, is way more effective than individual change ever could be. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, we actually have one more. Okay, so we have one of our readers hmm. is curious about agriculture. And oh, we just talked about what we can do. Um, and military. So I think maybe um, as far as like budgeting, I don't know if you have anything to comment on mm -hmm. that. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I talked a little bit and there was, there was a, a, ch a chunk of the section that was cut at the last minute of the book about, um, about regenerative, regenerative agriculture. Um, I would look more into things like um, what the Land Institute is doing in Kansas um, to imagine um, industrial or large scale agriculture on uh, uh, f in a fundamentally different way. Um, um, perennial perennializing agriculture. This they have this concept of perennialization, which means that it basically is non extractive um agriculture where you don't just like spray a bunch of pesticides and plant monoculture and it's not just like a it's not an extractive relationship with the land it's a it's a partnership with the land mm -hmm. and that is the same 
um, a core part of that is partnering with um, rural communities and agricultural focused communities of, of um, you know, making sure those communities are vibrant places to live um, as well as uh, um, instead of just, you know, like, I, I don't know, Walmart, you know, I'm talking with my talking with my parents um, who live in a very small agricultural uh, town in Kansas. Um, this is one of the things, um, you know, and they are, they are um, both Trump folks and they, um, they, they're, they, their main issue is like China and big corporations coming in and ruining our small towns. And that aligns with my politics too. You know, like I don't want to have, I don't want to have um, people being taken advantage of by um, organizations that are focused on profit or focused on extractive relationships with people that I care about. So, but I think that there is, there are ways that are, that align with, I don't know, like, um, you know, in this case, like, I think rural America would be hugely in favor of UBI if that if that was um, if that was explained to them in that way <laughs> or like, yeah. so like mm -hmm. this is a basis of making sure that that you have what you need to do the work that you need to do to keep your community vibrant. Um, right. I don't know. Like I think I don't know if you saw that. Um, I don't know if you saw it was real quick that. Um, you know, Andrew Yang's and a lot of Yang Yang spent a ton of time in Iowa mm. and for the primary and just like hitting the pavement, you know, like really mm. talking to a lot of people. And even though he didn't win, um, support for UBI in Iowa specifically went up like some crazy amount, like that 60 something percent where it was yeah. like 20 something percent before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just talking about it. Like, and that's the problem too, with climate change is that we, we, we don't talk about it hardly at all. I think climate change gets a total of, you know, 75 minutes per year total among the four major networks uh, on the, on the nightly news per year total. And mm -hmm. it's just like something that is hardly ever talking, talked about. Um, and it has risen, despite that, has risen to be one of the top three or four political issues, no matter what your party is. So people care about it, but they are not talking about solutions in a way that um, everyone knows, uh, everyone's not on a common playing field in terms of knowledge about solutions. So this is where, you know, something like just having conversations about UBI opens up an entirely new um, avenue for solutions for people that they weren't aware of before, just because it mm -hmm. wasn't even part of their realm of possibility. And now yeah. it is. Yeah, so, new imaginary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I love that term. Yeah, um, so that's great. Um, I had one last question, like on a hopeful note. <laughs> mm. uh, what about, so like, I'm just like curious, like what about this like future that you kind of lay out in the book? Like what about that future that you have in your mind that's totally possible if we do it, uh, excites you the most? Um, I think honestly it's, it's in, and I don't think this really came through very well in the final version of the copy, but I think in the, in the 2040s and getting to, to the year 2050, if we spend 25 years radically changing the world to make a society that works for everyone, imagine how proud of ourselves we'll feel at the end of that. Like we will feel like we can do anything and it will, it will unleash this sort of new era of creativity and a new, you know, like a new, um, a new sense of solidarity with people around the world. And I think that that is the thing that I'm looking for. And that is not something that I had ever considered before writing this book, that that, like, that came as a product of doing the work of seeing what is it gonna take? What exactly will it look like as it's happening? Then 
how do we feel when it's done? I mean, that's not something I ever gave myself the luxury of thinking about before writing this book. And I think to me, that is now one of the main things that's sort of bringing it through for me. Yeah, um, that's like a concept that we've kind of like talked about. I think Megan knows what I'm gonna say. Uh, we talked about this idea, cause you know, Andrew Yang was really focused on UBI. So we would talk about this idea of like a UBI renaissance. So mm -hmm. I feel like for you, like I feel like you take that, you take that concept to like a whole other level, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hearing you talk about it where it's like, um, we always thought, you know, like UBI affects everything and then it, and it does, but mm -hmm. also like, I think it's getting even deeper into that concept um, when you think about the stuff that you talk about in, in the book. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, really goes, cool. yeah, that would be great. <laughs> because I think what I what I am aiming for in this book is get, to get to the idea of we need to reinterrogate what what the purpose of us being here creating a civilization is. Mm -hmm. like, to me, the civilization a civilization is a, a something that we build to take care of each other. Like this is a, a compact that we have with each other that we are gonna look out for each other and make sure we do the care work that is necessary to make sure everyone has a thriving and great life while we're here. Like that to me is the main point of it. And I think right now we've sort of lost track of that to such a degree that it feels like it's just a giant competition. And yes. if you can't compete, then you're out of luck. And yeah. um, it doesn't matter, um, you know, there's really, I don't know, there's no way around, uh, there's no way to, to recapture that sense of solidarity unless you tear, da tear down the whole thing all the way down to the foundation and say, what is it that we're going to, to try to focus on? Um, because I think that's something that we all want and we don't want to make money we want to like um live a good life i think yeah. you know ubi is not uh not really about giving people money it's about giving people a good life so yes. yeah. yeah great way to put it yeah and also human dignity like that's another thing yeah. that um dignity yeah like to talk about me again yeah yeah the idea of we all deserve basic human dignity yeah uh, no matter who you are, where you're born, whether mm. you're in America or you know on the Marshall Islands. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that all that is like super exciting. I think when I you know talk, it, it's nice to think about talking to people about climate change now, in terms of like what can be exciting and what can be yeah. hopeful, yeah. and not just like like, well you're not doing all these things so you're part of the problem and i feel like that's kind of like the basic yeah. narrative that people align with but when you shift it to like but, you know we could have these cold trains and like you know we could have all these things and then like people won't be so like shit on all the time yeah. and like all of these things can, yeah. be, can be true you know so about um, avoiding the it's not about avoiding the apocalypse it's not about guilting people for not recycling it's not about you know it's not even about demonizing the oil industry or demonizing republicans it's about building up a vision that is more exciting than the vision that we currently have for the future. Yeah. And then people will just switch on their own because they'll be like, man, this looks a lot better than what I, I thought was possible. Yeah. It's giving people that, that like little spark of hope, you know, mm -hmm. that like it doesn't have to be the way you think it's going to be. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and that really all comes down to what you're saying when you first got on of like choices we all have choices and we're acting like that choice has already been taken away from us yeah and it hasn't mm -hmm. yeah right. and we all have an imagination so it's mm -hmm. like talking yeah. about the idea of like that's what imagination is like you you spark an idea for someone else and like they have a whole complete like yeah completely different brain that's going mm -hmm. to think of all sorts of different things that you would have never thought about yeah um so yeah that's exciting too 
which cool. is why we have the conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is yeah. why we have book yeah. clubs. <laughs> do you, uh, yeah. One random thought question I just thought of, like, do you, I don't know if you read like a lot of like science fiction or any like, you know, like other books, like do you, I don't know, or shows or anything, like, do you have any like recommendations? Yeah, no, I would definitely read Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. Um, Oh, yeah. I think that is something that is so uh, applicable for this year, for 2020. Um, uh, and also she wrote this 30 years ago and it takes place in the year 2024. So it's sort of like a parallel of um, my book in some ways. I, I think it's, yeah. I mean, um, I'm not comparing myself to Octavia Butler in any way, but, but like, um, <laughs> but I think that, um, I think that it's a caution, it's more of a cautionary tale. Um, and it's sort of like, this is what happens when we choose, when we get to the point in my book, when I, when I say, okay, we are now going to choose to, to treat each other better. It's like, we got to that point and then we chose not to treat each other better. And it's mm -hmm. like, we're gonna all descend into individualism to such a degree that it's like neighborhood versus neighborhood mm -hmm. for like survival. And so it's just a really good parallel to like what could happen and what that it's like, that's like, it's like where we're headed right now. Um, mm -hmm. If we, if we don't change course for sure. Okay. It sounds like Crest at 2038. Which is I was like, just going to say that. I was just going to say that. Yeah. I'm going to bring it up. Um, so it there's there. a book that we recently read. It's called Crisis 2038 okay. by um, Gerald Huff, who has since passed. But um, basically, it, it's a sci science fiction, right? Um, book. Science fiction? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm like it's so realistic about the future. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I went to say it. It's like AI, but. Is it twenty thirty eight? I guess so. Yeah. Um, future it's like a documentary about the future. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like essentially, but it's talking about like you know, in the year twenty thirty eight, what's going to happen if mm. we are if we continue on the path that we're on now? Um, yeah. So kind of along the yeah. same way, only his is more so around UBI. Um, okay. and but, AI. Yeah, and yeah. AI. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Also. Yeah. Um, UBI is a big, um, a big uh, sort of behind the scenes, um, what's it called, um, character in the Expanse books. Expanse. Uh, um, but it's sort of like, uh, I don't know, it's sort of like a bad version of UBI, though, where it's like, there's a black market for everything that's not covered under UBI. And I don't know, this is where the expanse is, the expanse is a series of novels where uh, it's about 150 years in the future and humanity has colonized the rest of the solar system. And um, there's a whole bunch of like solar system politics between Mars and earth and the asteroid belt. Um, and um, it's just, it's a book about colonization, politics of colonization and earth is this, you know, like past its prime, um, capital city. And, um, there's been, you know, like 150 feet of sea level rise and like earth has been in crisis for a very long time. Um, but it's still feeding itself based off all the resources of Mars and the asteroid belt. Um, and and they um and and so there's this version of ubi for for everyone on earth but um there's like a lottery system to qualify for it and like it's just it's not a very fair uh treatment oh. of it's not a it's not a very fair system that has been developed um yeah Sounds uh, like still like could be a good one for like young yeah. to read because it's like, well, what if UBI were the enemy? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah I mean, be, it's not even yeah. really, it, it's just sort of like behind this. It's it's not something mm -hmm. that they ever really talk about. It's just like, they yeah. call it basic, like, oh, you're on basic and you're not, or like you qualified for the lottery and you didn't, but it's just, it's mm -hmm. like more of like the politics of what, um, what emerges from a sort of like unjust and corrupt system where oh. UBI exists. <laughs> 
in the background, but it's mm -hmm. not really like fair. It's it's been it's existed for over a hundred years. Mm -hmm. Everyone on Earth has it or has access to it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, hmm. that's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. We'll look into it for sure. Um, Cool, cool. So um, before we go, I'm gonna quickly for everyone and just let, like, let you know if you're interested. Um, yeah. This is our next month's book. I don't know if you've heard of this. This came out June, I guess. Yeah, it came out like mid mid pandemic, kind of delayed it a little yeah, bit. Got, okay. got delayed, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, so this is like a memoir, road trip, kind of yeah. political yeah. book. But mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, but it's written by two friends who are, one's a Democrat, one's a Republican. And it's, so it's about their friendship and their travels together. And um, it's also a lot about like America and, and all the different yeah. states and places you mm -hmm. can go. So anyway, so uh, so yeah, so for to our, to our book club, that is our next book of the month, but let's all hold up our this month's book one more time. Yeah. We don't have it. I don't know if you have it. <laughs> and we have it lying around everywhere. But um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it is very pretty. <laughs> Were you just like oh, when you first saw it? Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. It's yeah. amazing. It's so it's a, pretty. one of the better climate change book covers I've ever seen. Oh yeah, um, it's, it's very like it catches your eye. I'm a very like visual and like uh, texture person when it comes to books like I have to feel them and if I look at it there's a certain look this is one of those that if I had seen it at like yeah. a bookstore like I got it online but if I had seen it at a bookstore I would have touched it and been like I need it <laughs> it's also like the 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 cover material it's like this um it's almost like felt or not felt but um but yeah yeah like uh it's like a journal it. and that's yeah it, and that's sort yeah. Of what we intend to change be, yeah, we wrote. Yeah, um, we wrote the book. I mean, the book is only like fifty six thousand words or something like that. It's a very short. It's 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 not. It's not. We intentionally wanted it to be shorter, like designed to be able to re read it in one setting. You know, if yeah. you wanted to like power yeah. through in five or six hours, you could read the whole book. Mm -hmm. So, um, the audio book is also only like four and a half hours long, I think, or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Which is really yeah. helpful, and you know, a lot of our people who like read our books, like they're not really like avid readers. They're just like, oh, yeah, yeah. book club. Like I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna learn about some yeah. stuff with you guys. And yeah. a lot of people do audiobooks, and so yeah, yeah. it's been exciting about this whole thing yeah. for sure. So, um, so thank you so much uh, for doing this. And yeah, uh, cool. can you just like tell us where we can follow you on? I don't know if you have a website, and also like if you have anything else coming up. Sure. Um... I um working on some projects right now. Um I um we just submitted a proposal to do an an augmented reality game uh that wow. was about uh that's about uh car rapture. Like if uh if all the cars instantly vanished what would happen how could we uh, adjust and like adapt and what would what would happen basically so i don't know if i'm even Ooh, small, no. that whole way, but <laughs> <laughs> it's okay we're a small group community we'll keep yeah. it a little secret <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah i mean that like i'm really interested in exploring this sort of like medium form thing where of, of like 10 to 15,000 words or like a 20 minute videos or like something like that. Um, I feel like that's yeah. sort of the space where, um, where I'm going to try to do my next work. Okay. That's okay. awesome. Cool. Mm -hmm. Look out for that. We're following you on Twitter. So, you know, yeah. and, and we'll stay tuned. And so yes, yeah, Twitter is like kind of the place to find you, right? You're pretty active. Twitter is where I put all, yeah, all of my energy in terms of social media for sure. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. So, Sweet, follow okay. I do have that link. We do have that linked uh, below for you guys okay. who are listening. We do have it linked, so that way you can find him on Twitter. Follow him. He, I really appreciate you because I feel like you are very up to date with like everything. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. feel, you know, who needs the Weather Channel? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <Eric. laughs> That's funny. Yeah, and if you yeah. want want to buy the book, um, I would encourage you to go to bookshop.org because it connects you directly with a local bookstore. Um, 
Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's I think we've the, used indie bound in the past. Yep. It's a similar Is that thing. The same? Yeah. It's a similar thing. Bookshop.org. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. We'll start using that too. Mm -hmm. Love it. Awesome. Um, great. So again, thank you so much and, yep. and we'll see more from you. Uh, thank you to our reader friends for being here and tuning in. Mm -hmm. uh, until next time, say bye. Yeah. Bye, guys. Me.